the city of power. You have to be prepared to be a little bit aggressive, but also be prepared to uh, bat your eyelashes when you need to to get things done. I'm Amir Paiva, and this is the story of the city of London. The city of London, or the Square Mile as it is known, is the oldest part of London and has been a global financial centre for centuries. But the city stands accused of helping create the global financial crisis through a combination of greed and reckless profit making. I want to find out more about this place and where it might be going in the future. Today, I'm heading to the highly respected London Metal Exchange, the world's centre for trading non-precious metals. Over the last decade, more than $40 trillion worth of trading has taken place here. The trading floor at the London Metal Exchange is very unique. It is the last open outcry trading floor in Europe. That means that here we have people using hand signals in order to transact business. So you will often hear people calling out, I'll buy at 100, I'll sell at 100. How will they decide to sell or to buy? They will be looking for any type of data that could make the price go up and the price go down. That means that if they spot an opportunity to either offset risk by hedging or take on risk by speculative investment, they will do that. They will take, uh, they will take trades on behalf of their clients, but also they will invest what's known as um, proprietary money. Uh, so they'll essentially be betting, or uh, don't want to use that word. Um. <laughs> but joking aside, Gambling and greedy short-term money-making is exactly what some have accused the players in the city of getting involved in. It's a world Grant Anderson knows well. He was once a city boy himself, until he left and wrote a best-selling expose of the Square Mile's sharp practices. The ideal city boy is ruthless, he's greedy, he is hyper-competitive. It's all about winning and making that deal. If you've got a trading floor that is dominated by young testosterone fueled males, they're going to tend to take bigger gambles, riskier gambles, than the average person on the street. So, if anything, it just creates a quite volatile, unstable system full of booms and busts. But was it always like this? I decided to meet an old-timer who has seen it all before. He told me that the city of 40 years ago was a very different place. It was a world apart. Uh, not only were half the buildings not here, um, but in terms of the attitude and behaviour. It depended on your class, you know, which public school, which you went to, or university, or obviously either Cambridge or Oxford, as a matter of which college, or potentially, if you weren't quite as bright, which, you, which regiment in the army you went to. And, the bar, and then, of course, it was institutionally racist. Uh, it was whites only. Uh, and, of course, women. What women? You turn if you want to. This gentleman's club started to break down in the 1980s when Margaret Thatcher was Britain's Prime Minister. The ladies not for turning. Large-scale computerization and market deregulation occurred in a process nicknamed the Big Bang. New technology like the mobile phone became status symbols and the city became more of a meritocracy where anyone could make money regardless of their social background or their haircut. But this was the Thatcher era. And of course then was greed good? Well, greed was certainly then more acceptable. And so you went from almost one extreme to the other extreme within a few years. As you saw, people were looking to try and earn huge bonuses on the basis of trading without necessarily having necessarily all the respect 
for the money they were looking after. And those old phrases which is, it's a privilege to look after clowns' money, not a right. The difference between the city boy now and the stockbroker of 40 years ago is then it was a little bit gauche to talk about money. Then it was a sort of a more refined world. Now it's much more in your face and blatant. It's about making money as quickly as possible. If we go out drinking late into the night, maybe people taking cocaine, people um, partying hard, taking clients to strip joints, prostitutes. It's a less refined, it's a less civilized world. It's, it's more blatant about what it's about. Very male. You go to most of the pubs here, 80% men. It certainly sounds like a macho man's world. So what is it like for women working here? I went to meet Sarah Flynn, a manager at a leading communications company. It's challenging. It is very much a man, male-dominated environment. Um, you have to be sure of what you're saying and what you're doing in order to survive. Very often I'm the only woman in a meeting, um, or one of very few, um, and you just have to be prepared to be a little bit aggressive sometimes to, to get what you want done and, and to get things moving. Is negotiating male egos like walking through a minefield? Yes, negotiating male egos is like walking through a minefield. Especially with some of the, the older gentlemen that I have to deal with who come from very traditional backgrounds and are used to dealing with, with men all the time um, who don't like being put straight by a woman, especially potentially not a younger woman. You have to know how to approach the situation, use your influence and persuasion skills to get them to see your point of view um, and occasionally bat your eyelids to get stuff done as well. What kind of roles or jobs do women have in the city? Are they in senior positions? I'm in a management role, um, but the majority of people that I deal with, my customers at sort of board level, CTO, CIO level, management, all tend to be men. I don't deal with many other women at the same level that I am. Um, a lot of women in the city, I think, take more traditional female roles, administrative, secretarial, that kind of thing. So the city remains a largely male-dominated environment, concerned with money-making above all else. Not that this is anything new. For centuries, the money men have seen themselves not only as a world apart from other centres of power, but actually above them all. London is made up of different places, and there are two major centres, Westminster and the City of London. And Westminster is always associated with the court, with the king, and the city has always been associated with commerce and trade. So, is the City of London a breakaway district which balanced power in the old times with, with Westminster? The real power usually rested with the merchants. They were the people who were very, very powerful. And they formed a sort of an, a, an alliance with the king. When the king needed money to fight wars, he would come to the city and they would lend him money. So they were in a very, very powerful place, and that's why traditions have built up where the city is almost apart from the rest of the country. It has its own rules and regulations. And this separation is physical too. If you go to the borders of the City of London, you'll see that they are all guarded by some fearsome creatures. The dragon behind me is the symbol of the City of London and it guards its borderland. On my right hand side is Westminster and on my left the city begins. It is at this very spot, at Temple Bar, where the Queen herself has to stop and ask permission from the city's authorities before she can enter. And it's not just these symbols of the city's power that have remained a constant for centuries. So have the streets themselves. This map is based on a 400-year-old design. None of the bridges you see here existed back then. But the city itself, the financial district, is here. Now, incredibly, the names and the layout of the streets of Square Mile haven't changed over four centuries. I'm meeting up with Justin Stewart again to get an insider's perspective 
on the city's board places. So just in looking at this map, this very old map, it seems the layout of this square hasn't really changed, has it? No, when you consider after the odd fire and one or two bombings from various peoples, it's actually in remarkably the same sort of style. When you think here, here's the Bank of England, um, and so that's, that would be the central bank. That's our central bank. With lots of gold underneath? Yeah, but we don't own any of it anymore, sadly. But that's where they make the decision on interest rates, and that was actually established then uh, uh, years ago, and it's a sort of the central bank, but also a bank in its own right. Oh, um, and then over here, we've got the Royal Exchange, and okay. the Royal Exchange has had a checkered history. It was a uh, stock exchange only for a short while. It was the futures market, the life market it was called. What is it now then? Now it's a rather swanky shopping centre. So eventually commercialism takes over. Next, we headed to a centuries old market. It was still operating today. Justin, where are we now? Uh, this is Leaden Hall Market on okay. the site of the old Leaden Hall, which is marked on the map here. But this is a sort of Victorian creation, but it was a market and a market which was primarily meat, but some fruit and veg. But there's, today there's still little butchers here, cheesemakers here, and so you can actually see proper commerce going on here as opposed to just people sitting at their keyboards the entire time. Oh. Our next destination was an old pub in the heart of the historic banking area. But this wasn't just any old bar. Right, what are you going to have? A glass of water. That'll do. Just saying, our pub is a favourite destination for traders. But not during the day. <laughs> Those days are long gone. Now it's in the evening. But this isn't an ordinary pub. Uh, this is actually one of the old coffee houses. And the coffee houses are important. This is actually Pasca Rosé's coffee house. It was founded well, 1650, 1652, something like that. Uh, a gentleman of Greek origin who was responsible for a lot of trade into, uh, into the Levant, into Turkey, into the Middle East. And these houses were used where, where you could actually have a, spend a penny for the day, sit here drinking coffee, and you would actually do your transactions, do your business. If you like, it was a sort of very early version of sort of someone like Starbucks. Starbucks. Nothing's changed except the quality of the coffee. It's worse. So there were actually deals being made here alongside the city of London. This is actually where you had the first trading places. So, for instance, the Stock Exchange started in a coffee house called Jonathan's, which is just a few alleys away from here. But there were coffee shops springing up all over the place for anybody who was trading in news. So you had the first journalists here in terms of insurance, but also in terms of the stock market itself. So it was a crucial area. But the key to London's historical position as the world's foremost global financial hub was not its architecture or its coffee shops. There is one thing here that never changes. One look at London from the air and the answer is clear. It's the mighty River Thames, a constant feature flowing throughout the ages. From early times, London has always depended upon the river to bring goods in and to bring goods out. So London has um, been a great trading city right from very, very early times. In the 18th and 19th century, London becomes one of the centres of world trade. So the river is absolutely crucial to that. And we get the building of docks in the early 19th century, the world's largest docks at that period. And the most famous of all those docks is the West India Dock, and that's where Canary Wharf is sited today. I'm taking a journey down the River Thames to have a look at Canary Wharf for myself. You can feel the immense history of London on this river. In the 1960s, the Docklands started to decline as bigger facilities were built closer to the coast. And within a decade, they were derelict. But nowadays, Canary Wharf is like an island devoted to capitalism and consumerism. It came about in the 1980s when the government declared the area a special redevelopment zone.
Originally, the glass and steel towers of Canary Wharf were conceived of as a rival to the City of London. Originally, the glass and steel towers of Canary Wharf were conceived of as a rival to the City of London. Now they work together to keep London as a whole in a financial league of its own. I'm heading to the offices of BGC Partners, international money brokers. They are like a sorting office for exchanging money, big money. These guys find buyers and sellers for international currencies, negotiate the deal, typically between the global banks, and take a healthy commission for themselves. This is a very lively, dynamic, buzzing place. Mm -hmm. Is it always like this? This is quiet. When it's noisy, when we've got a real crisis on, like we had, say, three years ago at the time of the credit crisis, the banking crisis, you couldn't hear yourself think. People walked out of here with great pools of perspiration on their shirts, dripping from the end of their chin or nose. Absolute pandemonium. But these people are built up on testosterone. They love it. And the busier it is, the more volatile it is, and the more fearful it is, the better they perform. So they know the rules, they live by the sword, and they die by it. So if they make money, please stay. Please make lots of money for the company. Please make lots of money for yourself. You fail, the door's over there. It's high pressure work. You can literally smell the sweat and testosterone in this room. I wouldn't mind a piece of the action, so I'm going to try it out in an artificial scenario. Hello, Amir. Hello, Amir. Emma, how's oil doing? The training I'm going through is designed to test one of the brokers and traders. The system can handle over 1,000 simultaneous voice calls and information feeds. Emma, I've got New York on the line. Emma, I might have to get to another client if this is the, uh, yeah, this is the speed of the purchase. No, no, no. The, we, 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 we're in with the blue chip, but oil is also... France, France, the famous stuff. Look at it. It's right. Oh, it's going, it's going down now. It's going down now, Simon. Yeah. Emma, they're riots in France. They write in France. Do we have any exposure to French shares? We are on the case. We are on the case. We're selling everything we have. In I mean, have you got New York up? Is that Simon still there? Hey, Simon. Come on, man. I need that update now. Now, that was a mock trading. I cannot begin to imagine what it is like in the real world with real money. No matter whose money. This job and so much stress is not for me. So why do they do it? Simple. They are very, very well paid. City boys can also earn themselves an extremely lucrative performance-related annual incentive. This bonus often dwarfs the already generous salaries they are paid. Well, the bonus system is the main system that rewards you in the city. Your, your basic salary, my basic salary in my last few years was £120,000 a year, which may seem quite a lot to, to viewers, but that's, that's only a small portion of the pie, really. And my bonuses for the last couple of years, for example, were £500,000. In the city, you are judged by your bonus. If your bonus is twice as big as Dave's, that means you're twice as worthwhile a human being as Dave. It really is simple as that. And alongside the fantastic money a career in the city offers, comes access to a world of privilege that most people can only dream of. How much would a car like this cost? Give us a, a range. Of... Well, I mean, you, you could start um, from around £130,000 for a Continental and go all the way through to 275000 uh, for a Mulsanne. Uh, and, and some cars you can go even higher depending on uh, the level of specification. Who pays such a um, massive price tag for well, a car like this? It could be anyone from um, perhaps uh, an investment um, banker, someone working in the city, working in um, hedge funds. 
I think you have to have a quite a, um, a strong personality to drive a car like this. Um, and I guess a, a, a sense of your own um, security. Um, I think I'd like to think that it says that that person is successful, is generous with their money, but I guess the obvious answer is they want to look great and, and yeah, look the part, and that's, that's what this car delivers. But very few people will ever be able to afford to drive cars like those. Right next to the square mile is Tower Hamlets, one of the poorest areas in Britain. Experts in the city say it's their activities that drive forward the global economy. But from these streets, that argument looks very thin. And some people have had enough. The square mile has become a symbolic target for demonstrators angered by the excesses of modern day capitalism. And it's not only protesters who have targeted the city as a symbol of wealth and power. The square mile has also been repeatedly hit by Irish Republican paramilitaries. In the 1980s and 1990s, the IRA targeted British financial centres with a number of highly destructive so-called spectacular bombings. But after the devastating 9-11 attacks on the financial centres of New York, the city began to make serious contingency plans for future catastrophes. Whatever happens, banks want to keep on making money uninterrupted. Since 9-11, uh, many trading floors have either got physical trading floors outside of the, the city in which they're currently uh, um, situated, set up themselves. They purchase a, a share in a, in a disaster recovery physical site. Or what we can now offer them today is you could sit at home as a trader, log into your PC and access your trading position and, uh, from, from your home using your mobile phone and a laptop PC. So these, these backup centres, how fast can they be up and running for use? Disaster recovery centres nowadays can be up and running within seconds. Uh, we had one of our customers here in the city that uh, invoked a disaster recovery trial period uh, a couple of months back where they brought 50 coaches to the front of the building, took them from uh, the building to the airport and made them fly to Brussels. Um, that took them several hours to physically get from one place to the other. The trading room took five, ten seconds to set up. All we did was physically switch those lines that were in the trading floor in the city across to the, to the, to the, the other place that was in Brussels. But the city's most recent catastrophe wasn't caused by fires, riots, terrorism or natural disasters. The global financial crisis happened because of the nature of the international financial system itself and of those who work within it. Because they reward only 12 months performance, Bonuses encourage city boys to take bigger risks, which if they work out, will generate bigger short-term profits and result in bigger bonuses for those prepared to gamble. So it's the equivalent of going into a casino, being told to bet with someone else's money, being told that if you make a win with that bet, you get to keep a portion in the form of a bonus. And by the way, the casino might fall down at any minute because all our senior colleagues told us constantly that the party was going to come to an end ever since I joined. Then you've had deregulation, so there's far fewer rules, there's far less scrutiny about what people do, so they can invent complex financial products which basically are designed or, or it's known that they will explode at a later date but it doesn't matter because people accrue big bonuses in the meantime. You've got these financial weapons of mass destruction which can have huge implications for the global economy if they go wrong as they did a few years ago. But many of those still inside the city reject such allegations. While they admit mistakes were made, they say the only hope is to allow the banks themselves 
to lead efforts for a recovery. Do you remember the day Lehman Brothers crashed? Do you remember when credit crunch started? No, you couldn't forget it. It was like the bottom of the world falling out. The markets were moribund. There was no deposit business going on. No bank could pick up a penny piece. Without the world's central banks, the Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, trust me, we'd be all crawling around the fields pulling out the odd beetroot to eat because that was the end of the world. Central banks have never really had the credit they deserve. How about a cap on bonuses? Because, you know, people say um, the job these people do here is nothing more than legalised gambling and they're gambling with my money. In the nicest possible way, I find that remark offensive. Capping is a no-go area. What we want is regulatory controls so that outrageous decisions aren't made, but you're not breaking up the infrastructure of the bank. Never want to hear the word cap, even though it's got one syllable, ever again in my life. So will the city change its ways? Or will arrogance, greed, and short-term profit-making continue to dominate the markets? Maybe the global financial crisis has taught the square mile a lesson it will never forget. Or perhaps making money and a feeling of superiority is too deeply ingrained in the city's DNA. It's been like this for centuries and it's never going to change. If you enjoy lively debate with some of the quickest minds... That's not true. This I goes right to the heart of a does. corruption in democracy. It's with an international angle. It's not brave. It is suicidal <laughs> for a politician to take such drastic steps. These are very interesting ideological times. I suspect you don't entirely agree with me. <laughs> Join me, Gavin Esler, for Date.